Good morning, my name is Claire Clark and I am from Dynam. We are supporting Highlands and Islands Enterprise to deliver this event today. It's great to have you all with us for this Business to Healthcare webinar. A very warm welcome to you all. Before I pass you over to Katrina Ramsey from HIE, I'd just like to spend a minute explaining how we will run today's webinar. As an audience member, you are automatically muted, but we have a couple of ways for you to get actively involved. You can use your question box at any point throughout the webinar and we will pick up as many as we can during the Q&A. You'll also see an icon called the raised hand icon and during question time, if you've got a mic and you want us to take you off mute so you can connect directly with our speakers, then just click on the icon and we'll get you connected. And finally, we always want to promote knowledge sharing and collaboration so we do record every session. We will, of course, share the recording after the event, so you can watch again or share with anyone else you think may be interested. That's all from me now. I'll pass you over to Katrina, who will introduce today's speakers. Katrina. Thank you, Claire. I'm Katrina and I work at Highlands and Islands Enterprise as part of the Northern Innovation Hub team. And the Northern Innovation Hub provides a range of business support for SMEs across a variety of key sectors, including life sciences, tourism, food and drink, creative industries, and has um, cross-cutting themes of technology and young people. Business to Healthcare is our programme that specifically supports health and care businesses and we're pleased that we have funding from Inverness City Region Deal and European funds to make this happen. Today we're exploring an interesting topic, the future of diabetes care, and it'll be really good to hear from our guest speakers who are specialists in this area and also any discussion that emerges in the Q&A, as I know a lot of you on this webinar today work in this area of prevention and management of this condition. So I'm delighted to introduce our host, Adrian Smith from Digital Health Sense, who is one of our specialist advisors um, for business to healthcare, and he provides a range of support to our participants. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Adrian, who'll start us off. Over to you, Adrian. Thanks, Katrina, and thanks, Claire. Uh, and thank you again to everybody who's joined this event. Um, you know, diabetes is a very uh, important area for us to look at. And I can recall a few years ago, uh, Lord uh, Simon Stevens, for a while, Sir Simon Stevens, I'm never quite sure what order to put his titles in, reminding us that obesity and diabetes are potentially the car crash that's going to destroy the NHS. That's how he described it, the car crash. And despite huge amounts of effort, uh, it's still the case today that huge amounts of NHS resource and effort and funding gets spent on diabetes. And there's still a great deal that we can do to improve both prevention and management of the condition. So I'm delighted to have a set of speakers here today who can tell us about some of the many things that are going on and the challenges that are uh, still facing us in the prevention and management of uh, diabetes. Uh, so today you'll be hearing from Partha Carr, who is the National Speciality Advisor on Diabetes for NHS England. You'll hear from Alison Grant, who's Engagement Manager for Diabetes uh, Scotland. But first of all, I'm going to hand you over to Sandra McCreary, uh, since we're here, all of us in the Highlands, it's great to start off uh, with Sandra, who's uh, firmly established in uh, diabetes transformation in the Highlands. So I'll hand over to Sandra to introduce herself uh, and her role and to talk to us first today. Thanks, Sandra. Over to you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, HIE, for the um, invitation to participate in in this webinar this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, as Adrian alluded to, I work um, in the Highland region of Scotland. I'm the Chair of Clinical Diabetes at the University of the Highlands and Islands, honorary consultant diabetologist with NHS Highland. You can see Rigmore, the hospital where our diabetes services are centred on a lovely sunny day that we hope will be forthcoming in the near future. And above that, you'll see um, the Highland Diabetes Institute, which is part of the Centre for Health Science, which sits on a campus um, next to the, the hospital and is part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. And it's lit up in blue, which was a feature that we had um, taken on a few years ago to celebrate World Diabetes Day when many buildings within um, Inverness were actually 
lit up blue thanks to the council. Um, so I'm just going to move on. So for many people, I mean, you're going to hear from experts, obviously, um, representing many people with diabetes, many staff who work in the area of diabetes. For many of us, of course, um, a cure for diabetes would be the holy grail. But in advance of that, what we're really looking at are where we can predict and prevent both type 1 or type 2 diabetes, predict and prevent the complications related to diabetes. And if not, then at least re reduce the complications by early detection or effective treatment. And linked to, of course, much of that, the hallmark of diabetes is the high blood sugars to get better blood glucose or glycemic control. Lots of advances now around glucose monitoring, sensing, closed loop devices being um, implemented in NHS England and Scotland. We're seeing the rollout of pumps widely across the type 1 population, but also looking at personalised therapy um, for people with type 2 diabetes. And there are many things I guess you'll hear about today, but from other sources around the detail of some of these future developments. But I'm just going to highlight for you a little bit about our region and some of the um, interest we've had in working towards that agenda. So here you see the health board split up across Scotland. You'll see that NHS Highland is the largest health board. We cover a land mass of about 42% of Scotland. That's equivalent to the size of Wales or the size of Belgium, two separate countries. And we have to provide services across that area and to many um, tertiary services for the Western Isles or for part of Grampian to the East as well. In Scotland, we're fortunate to have a national database, Sky Diabetes, and every year the data is analysed in the Scottish Diabetes Survey. It's published, like many surveys, of course, in retrospect. And here you'll see some of the data from the diabetes figures alluding to Scotland. Our population is just under five and a half million. The crude prevalence about 5.8% for diabetes, meaning that we've got over 300,000 people in Scotland with diabetes, and that amounts to just under 20,000 in NHS Highlands region with a crude prevalence of about 6%. Now, the one thing that's different up here and which really has informed our approach to diabetes care is our rurality. So here again, you'll see the map of the health boards with Highland in blue this time, but you can see how well matched that is to Scottish government's urban rural classification, where you can see that the vast majority of the area that we serve is actually very remote rural. And while it's lovely and it's a wonderful place to work, it does pose a number of challenges. The challenges relate to our demography. We have a, an older and aging population to the geography and trying to use the infrastructure we have to get around the region for patients to use the infrastructure and how we deliver services across this wide area um, from community teams and from specialist or secondary care teams. And the problems that raises around equity of care for people with diabetes and that's something that we're very conscious of in terms of implementing policies, guidelines, care for people that we try and consider how that could be equitable as far as possible. And that's what's really informed some of the research that we've taken over. So I'm just going to give you a quick run through one or two projects that have been embedded in this um, concept of rurality and around an interest of mine, which is around diabetic foot disease, because we have done a number of audits of our service locally and we were particularly concerned that people with diabetic foot disease were presenting with quite a high number of amputations and that over 50% of them weren't getting access to multidisciplinary teams. And that was related to how our service is actually modelled and how we failed to be able to get the service to cover these remote rural areas that we have and to the population, of course, who are most susceptible to diabetic foot ulceration. So just a little bit on the, the background of that, just for the, the context. So, Globally, about 15-20% of the population may develop a diabetes foot ulceration. Foot ulceration leads to amputation in many cases. And just under about 20% of our hospital beds are often occupied with people with diabetes. And for us, certainly in our local audits, about 47% of them are in with foot ulcer or amputation-related problems. We know the mortality is high with amputations, about 50% if it's a major amputation. 
was I within two years for, for complex reasons related to their comorbidities. But if you extrapolate the data that we know for NHS England around the cost of foot ulcers and amputations, we're spending about 84 to 96 million a year in Scotland on this. So there are, there are clear opportunities to try and improve care, quality of life for people with diabetic foot ulceration, also to improve the cost efficiency of our care and reduce the, the burden on, on the healthcare services. So we were trying to look at this in a kind of structured way and we were working with our colleagues in HIE to, to consider how this might look from a point of view of the diabetic foot approach and we called our programme the High Step. And we wanted to look at things from a management point of view to help with healing of ulcers, prevention, screening and detection and then prediction. And what we've tried to encompass that in is education for patients and staff and we have a, an ongoing programme for that within Highland Region. But anything that we're looking at, we're very keen that that data was shared with patients and staff. And I think that's important for self-management about empowering people to look after themselves, but giving them the right information to be able to do that. So the first project I'm just going to mention to you is called the RAPID project. That's reducing amputations in diabetes. And I see that I've actually missed the title of the slide, but this is, um, a schematic of how this actually works. So what we're trying to do with this project, which has actually moved on quite a bit over the last couple of years, is to take the service to people in their home, in the community, so that we're reducing the need to travel. Many of our patients have a 200 mile round trip to get to specialist services, to get to the specialist multidisciplinary foot team. So what we wanted to do is to use technology and in enabled integrated care to actually take our specialists to the generalists to the patient in the community and that meant developing a generic email server so that MD in the community who's looking after some of the foot ulcer could contact the specialist team who would triage them and look at whether they required advice or did they require to come to a hospital clinic did they see a specialist such as a vascular surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon or was they were managed by a video con consultation in the community and here you can see the setup that we've used for that. In the left hand corner there you see an omni so we worked with a company called Tactical Wireless to develop this. And this was essential because of the connectivity issues that we have in our rural areas. It has improved over the last few years but for many people access to decent broadband is really quite a, um, a vision for the future but 17% of all households don't really have that level of broadband where services can be enabled. So we took the routers out to link it into devices that could take images and conduct the VC. And we're using the Near Me system, which is called Attend Anywhere, but it's been rolled out widely in Scotland for patient consultations using our clinics as well. And optional to that, we added a laptop so that the generalist podiatrist or nursing team in the community could access all the diabetes systems and Sky Store lab results, patient data to inform and to enhance the consultation. And here you can see one of our specialist podiatrists in consultation with a generalist podiatrist in the community. And it's also been a very good way of actually upskilling our generalist staff. And we, we've done a number of evaluations through the University School of Health, which show how well it's accepted, how well the technology has gone down, and it has actually made some improvements. And we've done some health economic analysis on this and tried to scale that up in a model to suggest that if we were able to employ this service more widely, then we could be reducing, potentially reducing our amputation rate up to about 50%. So we've taken that on board. The initial pilot sites were funded by HIE and we've gone onto a rollout programme now. So we're actually dispensing this kind of equipment out into, as toolkits into the community for local podiatry staff to use and we've integrated it into our general multidisciplinary diabetes foot clinic so that we're not disadvantaging MD and we're sticking close to our principle of equity of care for these people within the community. Now a number of our practices, our GP practices, had very poor Wi-Fi um, a number of years ago and we piggybacked the RAPID programme onto a connecting health programme run by the European Space Agency, which was looking at a number of other factors from primary care around medical student education and around mental health programmes. 
with the coming of COVID, of course, many of the practices had upped their game in terms of Wi-Fi, and we weren't able to go out to quite as many practices as we'd actually hoped to with the CHC project. You can see in this diagram three remote practices that we've been linking to where we're using satellite to provide the Wi-Fi to enable us to implement the rapid project for patients with ulceration or high risk feet in these particular areas. And this project's ongoing at the moment. The evaluation continues with the Universal Highlands and Islands for our part of it on the rapid side of it. It's a programme that's linked into the University of Falmouth, where they're looking at the same technology but in care homes and looking at care delivered in that kind of setting. And it's something that's been very useful, I think, in terms of the connectivity and enhancing our knowledge of what might work and what the best options are. But also it's actually allowed us to think a bit further because we're using the system now for the educational side of um, diabetes foot care, both for the healthcare practitioners, which might be a practice nurse or a community nurse, and patients in the community who've got high risk feet and a high risk of either developing an ulcer in the first place or recurrence of ulcers if they've been previously affected. And that's proving very useful because the specialist staff are able to do that through this remote system. So one of the issues we have, of course, are screening people. We, we have screening programmes throughout the NHS for diabetic foot disease. And you can see here a breakdown of how people um, fare into the different risks, categories of low, moderate and high risk. And you can see how we carry out our screening procedures in a clinical or community basis. That's by using urofilance for sensory testing, feeling the peripheral pulse or using Dopplers where they're more difficult to palpate. And in Scotland, we again use the Sky Diabetes um, database to register these findings. We have an active foot ulcer section to the database as well to try and record everything so that we can continue to monitor the number of our patients who fall into different categories, how they move between categories, and if and when they have active foot, foot ulceration and when, whether that's in remission. But you can see from these photographs that what we do is really quite crude. It's very operator dependent in many ways. It can be difficult in the community for people to remember to put these um, outputs into the database, which primary care has to be then uploaded into Sky Diabetes as well. So there are a number of areas where the data may not be complete and we may not be able to always see the results of screening. And of course, during COVID, much of this screening actually fell by the wayside because people weren't able to have contact with their primary care or hospital care um, colleagues to have um, these procedures carried out. But one of the important things about diabetic foot ulceration and amputation is that we don't measure pressure measurements. It's pressure that often causes the ulcer in the first place in combination with neuropathy or vascular impairment. And that led us to think about how else we might be doing something about this. And we'd looked at insoles. There are many insoles in the market to actually measure foot pressure. They can be particularly useful when people who've had foot ulceration are at high risk of recurrence. What we were particularly interested in was getting much earlier in the process, looking at the foot before it gets to that stage, trying to assess whether pressures might be changing in a longitudinal fashion would be the ideal so that you can actually enhance the overall screening procedures, matching that up with the neuropathy testing, the vascular testing, etc. And we conducted a study using a foot scan map where we employed this in the clinic to get patients to walk over it to take foot pressure measurements and compared them to a population that didn't have foot ulceration and got very comparable results. It's easy to use and we'd be keen to look at this in a community setting, whether we could link it up with, say, the eye screening or to other procedures to get back to the idea of a one-stop shop for patients and to reduce the number of visits they have to make for different aspects of their care. And what would be particularly nice would actually be to see all of this linked up together, that we could get all the screening modalities put together in one part and linked up, as I say, to other screening programmes like retinal screening um, or urine microagman screening. You can see nice pictures on the right hand side here of somebody with abnormal foot pressures who, who've also had some amputations. And that's the kind of visuals that we can share with patients. It's really important to be able to share data because that data is important to people to actually understand where they are in terms of any complications they have, what that means, and to empower them to take the right action to try and offset these complications to try and intervene and to reduce the chance of them progressing. And I'm very much in favour of anything that 
shares data with patients in a meaningful way that's not just numbers, um, but actually gives them some idea of what their feet look like, what their eyes look like, or any other screening measures. So that's our vision. It would be to, in to introduce screening mechanisms that are less human dependent and to be using these prophylactically to allow intervention before primary ulceration occurs. And what would be ideal would be to develop algorithms, prediction algorithms that can standardise care for foot screening and monitoring linked into our patient data sets. And that's what would lead to empower people at the end of the day to address self-management and prevention of, of this very important complication in diabetes. And that took us on to the final project I'm just going to mention on diabetes foot care, and that is looking at data collection and AI. Because we have a good comprehensive nationally used data set, we've got um, information there on every health board that can be accessed. So we set an SBRI challenge, that's Small Business Research Institute challenge, um, with the Scottish Government to, to look at how that could be used in the prediction of diabetes foot ulceration, amputation mortality, and that's being run in NHS Holland at the moment. We're in phase two of that programme, and that involves us providing data sets from the Highland database li linked into other databases such as NRS and SMR1 data into a safe haven. We're using the Dundee safe haven for that. And it means that the companies that are involved in the process can access that data and then start to bring their machine learning to develop the algorithms that would predict risk and provide personalised advice to patients and through a very visual dashboard that can be shared with patients and with staff so that everybody knows what the state of play is in that particular patient's care. And this is a genetic type system that could be applied to any aspect of diabetes care. We're just employing it at this point around the diabetes um, foot ulceration aspects. So that's really the run through of the diabetes foot projects. And I know I haven't gone through them in detail. I just wanted to mention just two other projects that we're involved in um, more recently that might be of interest to, to the audience. And one again takes into account our rurality and that's looking at H1C. H1C is, is the marker against which most of the evidence base for complications and interventions is based. And of course, the, the technology for type 1 diabetes nowadays is, is becoming better and better, estimating H1C from continuous glucose monitoring. But it's still used widely, of course, um, as a marker for ongoing care, and particularly in the population with type 2 diabetes in Highland just short of 90% of our patients have type 2 diabetes and 10% about type 1 diabetes. And for many people, that means separate visits to their practice, nurse their practice to get blood taken for H1C, then a further visit back to, to go over the results and to look at their, their medication and their, their care plans. We were particularly interested to look at how we could actually take that out into the community using a device that you can see at the top there, the HemoSpot device, which collects dried blood for, from a finger snap, so you're using little lancets that you can see on the right hand side here that many patients are familiar with using if they're doing blood glucose testing. Blood's absorbed onto the filter paper. The device is closed, sealed, and then put in an envelope and sent into the lab. And we conducted a laboratory analysis of, of blood from, both from the clinic um, and from community samples, looking at how that might compare with our standard method of measuring H1C. And we got very good, very comparable results mean that it is an alternative method for doing this and I know that there are paediatric clinics in various parts of the country looking at these options. What we did also do is look at qualitative study to find out what people felt about it and we gave them lots of information about what the H1C actually meant and we got a very positive response in terms of how people might use something like this and again it, it's been something that's mooted as a, as a solution for this kind of testing during the pandemic when many people couldn't get to their, their services. Unfortunately we couldn't keep the clinical research going because much of that was shut down during COVID to prioritise COVID research. But looking at the use of this in a in a more integrated community setting would be particularly valuable, I think, in a rural community and something that we'd be interested in pursuing. And then finally, this is really just to let you know about an ongoing study that we have. Um, Adrian mentioned about Simon Stevens' comment on obesity, diabetes and the car crash for the NHS and, and as you'll see with many people having type 2 diabetes, well, the majority having type 2 diabetes, much related to lifestyle, 
obesity or being overweight. So there, there have been many programs looking at lifestyle interventions around physical activity and diet. And we have good evidence from the direct study. We've got an ongoing study with Roy Taylor around retuning for looking at people that aren't quite so obese, but looking at restricted diets. And in Scotland, we have a program for the prevention of type 2 diabetes. And we felt that was a good opportunity to be looking at people who have pre-diabetes who are in the category that may proceed on to type 2 diabetes, but who were obese to see whether we couldn't help keep these people from moving forward into the type 2 diabetes category. So we're using a, a local formula for a very low calorie diet and we're recruiting for this study at the moment with one of our dietitians in the, in the hospital. And we're getting some really impressive results for people, as you might expect, because we know it already works in people that are obese with type 2 diabetes. And diabetes is a spectrum from normal to pre-diabetes to diabetes. So I want to finish on that note just to let you know about that. And that's a, a really quick run through of some of the activity that's going on in, in Diabetes Highland at the moment. So thank you. Many thanks, Sandra. Um, very exciting stuff that you're doing there. And I hope you're going to stay around for, for questions. Uh, I certainly got a few, but I'll save them until the end. One of the things that you mentioned in there, of course, a lot of the work that you've been doing has been done with SMEs, with innovative um, suppliers of services as well. So as well as the three uh, speakers we have today, we have three little videos uh, that they're only short, two to three minutes from three of the SMEs involved in the B2HC program. And as it happens, the first one we're going to show, Sandra, relates very much to the focus on reducing amputations that you mentioned. So we're going to look uh, very briefly before we hand over to uh, Partha Carr, we're going to look at uh, a short video from a company called Warner Patch. The video is completely self-explanatory, so I will say no more. Do you know how people come to have amputations? Amputations happen because blood vessels rot away, preventing nutrients and oxygen going through to the limb, which leads to amputation. Rotting can be caused by smoking, diabetes, and even COVID-19. This condition can only stabilize or get worse. And this is not an isolated problem. Today, in the UK, 40,000 people are at risk of losing a limb within six weeks. Two years after amputation, only 50% survive, and those who do have a radically reduced quality of life. And this is true even when they are within their 30s. So what can we do? How can we prevent this condition from getting worse? Imagine if we had a crystal ball that could foresee problems ahead while also keeping patients out of the hospital. Wonopat is that crystal ball. It's a non-invasive sensor that continuously assess tissue composition at different layers. It essentially gives a 3D map of tissue composition over time. It works like a phone. It directly transmits the data from the patients to the doctor. Warner Patch has a seven day battery life. It might not sound like much, but trust me, this is a big deal. This condition costs 1.5 billion pounds every year to the NHS. With one patch fully deployed throughout the UK, we could save half a billion pounds every year. This has been an incredible journey with an amazing team. We finalized our clinical trials and with a new Innovate UK grant, we are bringing our product to market. As part of an NHS accelerator program, we're on track to provide it by the end of 2021. I'm Dr. Berthelot, and I created Warner Patch to improve lives and keep people out of the hospital. Are you a commissioner, a healthcare provider, a clinician, a patient, or a carer? Get in touch to know more. Thank you. Thank you. So, as I say, a good example of uh, sorts of innovations that we're seeing coming through the B2HC program that Highlands and Islands Enterprise have uh, funded. Uh, unless my colleagues shout otherwise, uh, we have two more videos, which I'm going to save till a little bit later. 
uh, because I'd like to introduce uh, Partha Carr. So Partha, I before you arrived, I introduced you very briefly, but I didn't in any detail explain your role and responsibilities. So I'm happy to just hand over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invite. Um, and uh, so just to give a brief overview, uh, my name is Partha Carr. I'm a consultant in diabetes. I work in Portsmouth and I hold in this diabetes space a national role specifically looking at different portfolios within diabetes. I share this platform with uh, Jonathan Balabji, uh, one of the previous speakers you heard about the work going around uh, prevention. Jonathan Balabji tends to look into that. Uh, I tend to share out the treatment and care, hospital safety and technology. So I've been asked to speak a little bit about the overview and please feel free to ask any questions you would want. Um, and I think rather than sort of going through lots and lots of slides, what I wanted to do was um, probably share with everybody a few things that's going on, in, which in my book is probably trying to distill down where we are with diabetes care. So if you look at the spectrum of diabetes care, we start with type 2 diabetes. Obviously, the big, big focus, as mentioned, has been on prevention and a lot of it based on evidence base, people coming from the direct study. There are lots, lots of debates which are up to over it is because the Daily Mail labels it as the, you know, soups and shakes diet and people ask about its sustainability. People ask about why don't we try other forms? I've got a very pragmatic view towards it, which is uh, offer people something that they can sustain and afford. And, and that's one of the biggest challenges in the present world. So we know from all diet studies across ever, uh, it, sustainability is an issue. And that's not just due to simple things like willpower and stuff. That's also because affordability. And I have this conversation with many people who will be very evangelical about the belief that only one diet works. And I always have said that that sort of approach can only come from a degree of privilege when you say that's just one thing, that's one magic bullet that works. So that's important to bear that in mind when we talk about prevention or even improvement of type 2 diabetes. So that's going to be a big thing going forwards. And as um, and I think it's fair to say, as um, the pandemic has shown, the big thing has been about issues around deprivation, how we try and tackle it and we go from there. So that's type 2 diabetes, the whole set around the, di the prevention side of things. And of course, the overarching type 2 diabetes main management is around prevention. I think then you move forwards a little bit into the treatment care, treatment agenda side of things, it automatically switches on to a very different world from where it was, let's say, five, six years ago. The advent of newer drugs, SGLD2 inhibitors, GLP-1 analogs, and a big exciting thing about it has been what NICE have turned around and said, it's about cardiovascular outcomes, heart failure outcomes, or indeed renal outcomes with SGLD2 inhibitors coming to the fore. So that's fundamentally change a lot of how we do diabetes care and systems trying to adopt to that and you're moving around from a system of saying this is only one way of doing type 2 diabetes now, i remember being in a space where it was diet exercise metformin glycoside insulin that was it nowadays you're moving more towards diet exercise still at the top you've got metformin if you can tolerate it and then you're moving towards well what does the patient have what is the high risk have they had a cardiovascular event have they have they got heart failure have they got renal issues and you pick your drug accordingly so a very, very big paradigm shift with hard outcomes, which has been very difficult to find in type 2 diabetes space. At least it didn't exist seven, eight years ago. But now, study after study has started to show that, which has been quite promising with this new class of drugs. So that's a bit around the newer drugs and stuff in type 2 diabetes care. Then if you move a little bit more downstream about, you know, what you're trying to improve, obviously amputations, a big, big focus across the country. You'd be delighted to know as a country, actually, we have started to improve our amputation rates. And if you look at OECD data, it does say that the UK's amputation rates in diabetes are actually one among the top three or four countries in the world, which sounds like a surprise, uh, but it is what it is. So if you look at other countries, so lots of investments have gone in, lots of focus from clinicians over the course of time, but again, skews towards deprivation. So, you know, smoking, risks, etc. So amputations are a big thing. And the final bit also to mention that space will be around safety. So inpatient safety, when you're going around hospitals, are people safe when they come in? So those have been the big, big sort of tickets, so to speak. You've got your prevention, you've got your change in diets, you've got your whole change in paradigm of treatment of type 2 diabetes care, and of course, safety and amputations. 
And finally, the big one that comes around is type 1 diabetes, because the type 1 diabetes care in my book has fundamentally changed and it continues to change. And it's about how can we help people more with self-management. So we've had a nice recent report about the position of flash glucose monitors and CGM, and that's a big leap for us as a country. It will, of course, take time as ever to implement it, but it's going the right way. Huge numbers of patients are not covered. And we have had a massive shift in the type 1 diabetes population from where things were, whereby you had a finger prick, and now we're moving the majority of people in this country do not use finger prick as their main way of doing it. They're, they're checking their glucose, which has been a huge shift. And then you've got the tantalizing prospect of closed loops or so-called artificial pancreas, not quite the whole thing yet, but as close to it as possible. So exciting times in the world, but I think a big focus on type 1 diabetes has been about uh, technology offering people more self-management, so whether it's flash glucose monitoring, CGMs, etc. And then, as I said, about artificial pancreas, etc. So those are the big focus. And I think we are missed not to speak about a few, fair few other things uh, which I add on. One is about the whole agenda on self-management and education. And are we providing the right type of education to people? The data would suggest not quite, which is why we're moving more into the digital space with the caveat that it's also not accessible to everybody, but neither is face-to-face. -face. And which links it nicely to the whole talk that we have around deprivation. Ethnicity is there, but ethnicity and deprivation, which I always keep saying, are not the same thing. They're cross sections between them, and we should not make the mistake that deprivation is equal to ethnicity. So, uh, and if you look at it, whether it's access to technologies, access to good care, access to education, all of it is skewed. And uh, I'll give a simple example that we've been looking at in the England space. Uh, for example, when we talk a little bit about can people get technology, and then you go and find out why they're not getting it. Well, the answer is because certain centers have decided, rightly or wrongly, that patients must have education, which is fine. But that must is, first of all, it cannot be a must, you can only offer. But once you put a clause in there, then you've got to make that education available to everybody. And the, if, the, if the system is that, well, you have to come to the hospital, you have to do it five times a week, and if you don't do that, you're not going to get the technology. For a mother who's on a zero-hour contract with two other kids to feed, uh, five days off is not an option. So, you know, and it's not even a priority. So guess what? They don't get the technology they need to help their self-management. So those are the simple areas, similar to the diet that we need to bear in mind. So that's probably a very quick run through as to where we are with diabetes. Start right at the start with prevention, very exciting times as to what we can offer to people. But again, the main thing for me is about sustainability. Then you've got the whole change of treatment care with these newer drugs and you fit the drug to the patient for maximum CD outcomes. You have a focus on foot care, you have a focus on inpatient safety, and then you get into the type 1 diabetes space, which is very much around the whole world of technology and self-management. Peer support is much more normally higher in this community because of the use of social media, etc., and that always helps. And I keep on pushing self-management and peer support simply because we don't have enough healthcare professionals. So there's, you know, we can throw as much money at it, we just don't have enough nurses and doctors and pharmacists to do all the diabetes care we need to do. So that's pretty much a run through. And I just wanted to, as I said, spend about seven, 10 minutes just talking about where the priorities are, what are the pressure points, what are the main areas of focus as ever. There'll be 125 other priorities in diabetes care people. So what about dialysis? What about pregnancy? What everything is important. But as I said, as a system, if you want to improve things, then getting the right drugs, focusing on the deprived population, giving self-management tools is probably going to be the way to try and tackle some of the inequalities and outcomes that we have. And I will very happily take any questions or anything that you might have. So, Adrian, over back to you and fire away as you would like to. Thank you much, Martha. I know that you're unable, I think, to stay with us to the end of the, the session because we're going to have lots of questions at the end. So um, I will use my chairman's privilege to ask you a question now and see if there's any others that would like to uh, throw something at you too. So the whole question about um, self-management structured education has mm -hmm. always been a, a big challenge and, and, and it's because of the two dimensions. On the one hand, historically, we've asked people to go on face-to-face -face training courses and you mentioned Jonathan Valabji, and, and Jonathan has always been a, a staunch champion of the face-to-face -face, uh, impact. Yeah. But mm -hmm. exactly as you say, in the world we're in, we have to deliver that education remotely and digitally. 
But at the same time, we have the challenges about digital inequalities, not just the access to digital therapeutics, but the skills, the motivation, the confidence to use it. Do you think we've got the balance right at the moment? Is there more that we can do? And when we do yeah. the next video in a minute, we'll be talking about that as well. Not quite. I don't think we've quite got the balance right. I don't think we, I think we're struggling to find the right mix, if I'm very honest. And I think we have always in the NHS, because of funding, because of the way we do, we try and sort of fit one size to all, which we know doesn't work. Whether it's, and we tend to swing like a pendulum, which is also our fault. You just go like everybody face to face, and then suddenly the NHS goes like, no, everybody digital. And you go like, okay, well, no, it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I think what we're not very good at doing is giving that option on the table to say, look, some people might want to go digital and some. So if you look at how flash glucose monitoring has exploded, it's because a lot of people did it online at home during the pandemic. The pandemic was a silver lining in that respect that it all just exploded. Yeah, fine. Send, send me the link. I'm on it. And I think those are, that's the way about how we want to take forward structured education because, you know, a lot of not, there is a plus to the structured education face to face about the whole camaraderie and the community feel and you're with other people. Yeah. But there are also lots of other people who don't want to do that. They're like, you know, I, I just don't want to sit with people and talk about diabetes. Thank you very much. I just want to have it in my own house. So I think we haven't quite hit the sweet spot yet. I think the data that comes through will be quite important to see how many people we're picking up and then we can go from there. So, yeah. Okay, and then another quick one. You mentioned that on the amputation front, which is the piece that uh, Sandra was talking about early on, that we are well up the league table in, in terms of uh, comparison with other countries. Do we know why that is? Is it something different that we do or is it something about the patient themselves? No, I mean, we actually, as I said, the amputation rates, if you sometimes read the media and some of the push, it feels like, you know, we are in dire straits. We're not, according to the data. I think that's the first important thing. And I the NHS is not very good at sometimes praising itself for the work it does. And I think people forget that, you know, amputation has been on the agenda of people for the what, last 10, 15 years, as long as I can remember. And that always takes a bearing, you know, in the sense of people have had a focus on it. Now, when we look at variation, and there will be in a country of this size of healthcare system in different styles and shapes, but overarching, you do well. And I think to your question, I think people are getting more aware of it the checks that primary care does that has a bearing we can always have our anecdotes as to what doesn't work but generally speaking i think people are better at saying well and i think commissioners are seeing that that's the biggest cost in the diabetes world so you're going like and when you're sitting there with a prioritization list which i'm afraid commissioners have to do I mean, in spite of everybody saying they're you know fund everything it comes up you know put it under any quality you basically go like actually this one will give us the maximum return i have to invest here and then you will have somebody else falling off but that's how unfortunately a taxpayer system works so yeah. which is probably why i think you've seen the changes they've seen okay all right well well thank you i, I, I will close it there Parthi. you're welcome to stay if you wish but understand completely if you disappear uh, yeah. thank you very much indeed for joining us we're going to swap to a second video now which is about um uh, self-managed structured education uh, so claire if you're able to show the second video from map my uh, diabetes map my health that would be great thank you type 2 diabetes is a very common condition these days for someone who has just been diagnosed it can be a very anxious time Map My Diabetes is a new approach to managing your diabetes. Created by NHS doctors, nurses, and people with diabetes, Map My Diabetes can help you to help yourself. Reducing the risk of complications and giving you an all-round better quality of life. Map My Diabetes is a simple online program which helps to strengthen the relationship between a patient and their doctor. We call this collaborative care, and it is similar to how an athlete and coach work together. Input and information flows back and forth between the two, building a unique picture of your treatment and your progress. This is tracked alongside aspects of your lifestyle, such as what you eat, how much you take exercise, your general state of mind, and other factors that can crop up. You and your doctor can access this information anytime on a desktop computer, a tablet computer, or even a smartphone. This helps you both to see what works best for you over time. 
and allows you to agree and set goals that can improve your health. And remember, this data isn't shared with anyone else. It is totally private and complies with the most stringent security and NHS digital standards. Above all, this is a way of reducing the impact of diabetes, giving you a better quality of life, improved health and reduced anxiety. It also saves time for you and your doctor, giving you both a clear picture of your diabetes. If you want, you can choose to share this with your own family, friends or carers. It's entirely up to you. So, if you have type 2 diabetes and an email address, that's all you need to get started. Take control with Map My Diabetes. Work with us and we can work for you. Okay, thank you for that. So that's a second example of the um, small and medium-sized enterprises that Highlands and Islands have supported as part of this program uh, and able to offer services and solutions in the diabetes area. Uh, so we're now going to swap to our third and uh, final speaker. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Alison uh, from Diabetes Scotland uh, to introduce herself and to give us her view and uh, approach. Thanks then. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so my, my name is Alison Grant um, and I'm the Engagement Manager with Diabetes Scotland. So I'm not a clinician. Um, my role is around engaging and influencing um, healthcare systems um, by advocating and representing people living with diabetes. And hopefully you can see my screen. which doesn't appear to be moving for me now. Sorry about this. There we go. So um, I just wanted to start by saying that people um, living with diabetes are at the heart of everything we do. Um, and I've just put up a slide there showing our current strategy. And to develop this strategy, we conducted the Future of Diabetes conversation. And 9,000 people shared their experience of living with diabetes with us to help us shape our priorities. So you can see there that we have um, two ambitions. And through these conversations, we've developed five outcomes um, to help us and drive us towards our vision of a world where diabetes can do no harm. Underpinning everything that we do, we have four key cross-cutting areas which are also on the slide there. So we're currently in the midst of um, marking 100 years since the discovery and the first use of insulin, um, considered to be one of the 20th century's greatest medical discoveries, which has saved millions of lives. From the Scottish doctor who won the Nobel Prize for its discovery, through to the development of the insulin pen, Scotland has led the way in advances in diabetes care and technology. Diabetes Scotland was delighted to support Scotland's leading research institutes to host a series, a series of webinars celebrating 100 years of insulin, looking at the past, present and future of diabetes research. Over the five webinars, over 20 researchers, professional advisors, industry specialists, presented their work. We also heard from four people with lived experience of diabetes and how the condition has affected their lives. Recordings of these um, webinars are available on our website and I would encourage you to have a look at them. So diabetes is serious. The pandemic highlighted just how serious it is as people with diabetes were more vulnerable to developing severe illness if they got COVID. While healthcare professionals across the UK have worked tirelessly throughout this period, the pandemic has significantly impacted access to vital health checks and support. Altogether, people with diabetes have been one of the groups most affected by the pandemic and should be at the heart of government's plans to support the country and health systems as it rebuilds. And I've just put some 
some data up on the screen there. So um, I, Sandra already referred to the number of people living with diabetes in Scotland. And that diagnosis has doubled in the last 20 years. Cases of DKA, diabetes ketoacidosis, have been steadily increasing since 2004. And diabetes accounts for about 10% of the NHS Scotland budget, spent largely on avoidable complications. So one of the challenges um, at the moment, which Partha also referred to, is inequality in diabetes. So I've put up on the slide there a quote from one of the one of the people that we spoke to um, when <coughs> researching for our diabetes is serious campaign. In a recent survey of a thousand people living with diabetes, one in ten told us they were having trouble affording the things they need to manage their diabetes. Gaps in diabetes outcomes between richest and poorest is widening, as evidenced in a University of Edinburgh study funded by DUK, um, which I referred to in the last slide, about increased rates of DKA. The report highlighted that those from socially deprived areas were more likely to be hospitalised or die as a result. We've also heard about the, the challenge of obesity and overweight. So living with overweight and obesity accounts for about 80 to 85 percent of a person's risk of developing type 2 and obesity rates are highest and growing among those from our most de deprived communities. And just to reiterate, this is not about lifestyle choices, it's about social determinants of health. A range of external factors make it difficult, often impossible, for people on low incomes to make healthy choices. Ultimately, the amount of money someone has in their pocket dictates what they can buy. So to tackle health inequalities and reduce the strain on the NHS, we must also consider those key areas out with the health system that impact on our health, such as rising rates of poverty. So one of the areas um, in the organisation that we're, we're looking to try and um, tackle inequalities is through our social innovation lab. So <clears throat> since last summer, Teams across the UK have taken part in the ongoing Social Innovation Lab, focusing on how to tackle inequalities in diabetes. Covering topics such as increasing uptake of eye screening services in areas of deprivation and producing solutions to overcome language and cultural bar barriers to health services, our teams have been co-developing solutions with people living with diabetes and we're excited to announce that we're expanding our lab to welcome more teams in June. If you're currently working to reduce inequalities in diabetes, for example, with accessing technology, and you want to join a diverse community of change makers, please get in touch with us via our website. And you can see on the slide that you know we, we provide support and <clears throat> um, we provide seed funding, team coaching, supportive work workshops, um, etc. Another, um, another challenge we see is the implementation gap. And what I mean by that is the, is the, the gap between seeing policy um, determined and then seeing that put into practice. So I've, I've put three areas up there. Um, so the Diabetes Improvement Plan, which has eight priority areas with a range of commitments under each. And we were delighted um, that the campaigning that Diabetes Scotland did to raise awareness of the emotional and mental health challenges of living with diabetes in the It's Missing campaign is now reflected in the refreshed plan. And we look forward to seeing implementation of the recommendations from the Short Life Working Group chaired by Dr Kirsty McLennan with representation from people living with diabetes, Diabetes Scotland, as well as clinicians. Um, we've also heard mention about the, the healthcare, annual healthcare checks. So people living with diabetes are, um, have key annual checks. Um, we know that these checks dropped considerably during the pandemic 
and we need to see these re-established to prevent people living with diabetes developing devastating complications. In the middle there, I put access to diabetes technology, and, we, and we've heard some mention of that already. So access to the right technology can be life-changing. With numbers of young people using, and while the number of young people using insulin pumps is growing, only about 10% of over 18s use them. At the end of 2021, Diabetes Scotland contributed a patient organisation submission to the Scottish Health Technologies Group on closed loop systems. And it's rewarding to see the SHTG recommendation that, and I quote, to minimise inequalities in accessing diabetes technologies, clinicians should proactively initiate meaningful discussions with all patients with type 1 diabetes about the suitability of a closed loop system for their individual circumstances. And we look forward to seeing that recommendation being implemented acro across Scotland. Um, at the end there, we've got the, the, the a healthier future um, framework for the prevention, early detection and intervention of type 2 diabetes. This framework is now in year five of a five-year funding programme. So Scottish Government had a clear vision around this, but COVID has severely impacted its delivery. Um, things such as staff redeploy redeployment, information government governance issues with IT, and access to IT by people living with diabetes. So our role around all of this is, um, is to communicate with everybody in the system, raise awareness, listen to people living with diabetes, listen to people working in diabetes, celebrate successes. We also create the space for change by campaigning and influencing. Um, we make change happen with partnership working, supporting NHS change makers, and we connect and collaborate by developing peer support, by convening people and crucially connecting lived experience to the system. And one of the areas that we've done this is um, a small project that I've been involved with in Highland around digital, digital inclusion. Um, to try and tackle digital inequality. So in one of our Making Change Happen conversations that we have periodically, we heard from people living with type 2 about how the diagnosis impacted them, how they struggled sometimes to access the right information. And this led um, in some way to a proposal to develop a new project. So led by NHS Highland, partnering with High Life Highland, AbilityNet and Diabetes Scotland, we'll see a small number of iPads preloaded with access to trusted websites and a SIM card. And these will be made available to people newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes or at high risk of developing type 2 who do not have access to digital technology. <coughs> Excuse me. So they will be able to borrow these iPads via their local library or library van, and it will enable them to access structured education, which Partha referred to, um, provided by the NHS. It will enable them to access trusted information from websites such as Diabetes UK, and also, if they wish, um, to access uh, digital peer support. Um, just a wee bit about the research. So Diabetes UK is UK's leading charitable funder of diabetes research. We improve lives through pioneering research into all forms of diabetes and diabetes related complications. The work we support helps us to understand the causes of diabetes, bring about life changing breakthroughs in care, treatment and prevention and bring us closer to a cure. In 2021, we invested over £6.4 million in diabetes research to kickstart 31 new studies. And more information um, about that is available on our website. 
So to conclude, I referred earlier to the celebration of 100 years of insulin and the past, present and future of diabetes research. What we need to see now is people benefiting from the great work and getting access to the technology that would allow them to manage their condition more effectively. And secondly, tackling the conditions that lead to wholly avoidable rates of type 2 in our least affluent communities. We can then get closer to a world where diabetes does no harm. No harm. The prevalence of diabetes and its growing nature means that if we get this right, it could transform the landscape for healthcare and help more people to live well. Great way to round off the uh, three presentations we've had today, which I think have been a really good balanced uh, set of views. Uh, we do have time for some questions, but before we do that, please don't go, remaining attendees. We're going to do our last short video from one of the companies that Highlands and Islands are supporting, and then we'll swap into your questions. Thanks if you could play the final video from Healthy IO. Meet Ollie Oaks. Ollie has diabetes and is at risk of kidney disease. What? Kidney disease is unfortunately without symptoms, and Ollie has been postponing his annual checkup for a while. I wasn't postponing it. I was just going to do it later. Calm down. I said at risk. I didn't say you have it. <sighs> Thankfully, we have a solution. Hello? Hi, this is Sarah from Healthy IO. Is now a good time to send over a test kit? The correct answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> the problem with CKD is that it doesn't have any symptoms and it can be a hassle to go get tested. CKD? Sounds like an 80s boy band. Are you going to get that? Thankfully, there's a test kit that comes straight to your doorstep. The test is quick and easy to use. Do you mind? Could I have some privacy? It can help detect... Could you stop talking? I've got a very shy bladder and you're distracting me. It can help detect CKD in its early stages, allowing us to treat it and preventing the condition from getting worse. Ollie's results are normal, but his diabetes does put him at a higher risk for CKD, so it's important he repeats the test annually. Tell me, Doc, am I unusual, or does this sort of thing happen to a lot of folks? No, you're not unusual. There are 11 million Britons who need to do this test annually, and of them, 6.8 million don't do it. Thankfully, you're no longer one of them. I'm chuffed to bits. It's brilliant. You just pee and click. Simple as that. Thank you, healthy I.O. For my kidneys and me. OK, thank you. So, uh, at a couple of points in the presentations today, we've, we've, we've touched on retinal screening but my un understanding at the moment in Scotland is that it's not one of the priority uh, SBRI funding areas. Is retinal screening, you talked a lot Sandra about foot ulcers, where is wh where are we in Scotland on the retinal screening front, what are the initiatives that are underway and are there more things we could be doing? Either of you can answer that, I don't mind. Sorry. Um, the retinal screen is not one of the SBRIs at the moment. They're um, about diabetic foot disease inpatient diabetes care, and the third one's around osteoporosis. That's where the funding is going at the moment. Um, there's been a bit of research showing that the interval for screening, for routine screening, can increase to two yearly now for um, the majority of people with, with diabetes from the annual check. So I, I think that reflects the years and years of experience we've got of using the, the Scottish diabetic uh, retinal screening system and all the data that's come about um, from that. So I guess the important thing is about um, ensuring that people are aware of screening and go to their screening consultation. That comes back to that little video that you just showed around the microalbumin again. It's about people being aware of it. So that's part of the educational package, of course, is being aware of it and keeping it in mind and being compliant with um, attendance as far as possible. 
And it, in some ways, obviously, that becomes more crucial when it becomes a two yearly screening interval, because at one year, there's, there's maybe that kind of annual thing. It's like your birthday or Christmas, all these things that come around annually. Yeah. You know, you think time to get the screening and either you try and remember or your community health care practitioners remember. I mean, from my point of view, I think I mentioned earlier, I, I'd be really keen on the idea of the one stop screening. I think bringing things together again and I, I don't want to sound to Luddite, but in the past we would do that in the diabetes clinic. The eyes would be screened, the feet would be screened, the urine would be screened all at the one time. The problem, of course, was the results all came back after the patient left the clinic. So you were then writing to them saying, yeah. oh, your test was X, Y and Z. And what you'd actually like to do is discuss the results with the patient in the clinic so you have them in advance. So either it's done there and then, which is what we would do in our clinic, in a face to face clinic with HB1C testing, we do it from analyzers that do it um, in the clinic. Or they've had it done in advance and you can see it. And but it's really difficult to coordinate things like that because the appointments are all over the place. They're different systems, you know, and people have different opportunities to attend for these things. So if there was some way of bringing the eye screening, the urine screening, and the foot screening together, so you had a package, and that yeah. was done for people on a regular basis. And of course, that's in the electronic record, so you can actually see it. And that helps inform the consultation you have with people. So it's not just about the numbers, it's about everything. It's about looking at the thing holistically, if you like. And in terms of those that are um, have um, eye disease or at risk of eye disease, then there obviously there are systems on ongoing now where there are there are actually some of the um, the modern technologies actually in the high street optometrists now to be doing some of that. They've already had cameras for many years and can opportunistically pick things up, but they've actually got access to to other equipment to do um, more sophisticated testing for people where it's, it, they've gone beyond the sort of the eyes are fine and the screenings not been an issue. Okay. So. And I know that there are other devices out there looking at where you might use apps, you know, phone apps, et cetera, for being able to do screening in a kind of more ad hoc basis. But it's, I guess it's looking at the best of these, pulling them together and getting something that's acceptable to people, but it has to be quality control, because it's really important that we we don't miss things, you know, that we don't get lots of false negatives or, or alternatively too many false positives, which is very worrying for, for people with diabetes as well. Okay, thank you. A couple of questions have come in. So, so one's about uh, relates to that and about the awareness. So, Alison, you talked about the um, the social um, consultation side, and we're encouraging people to engage in that. Is that part of raising awareness generally of what's available and what they are? And then a related question, which I think was really directed at you, Sandra, is about you, you mentioned about data sharing and your keenness to share data with the patient. And the question says. Um, Patients still worry about what's going to happen, though, with their data. So how do we get over some of that problem? So, Alison, could I ask you to say a little bit more about the, the social consultation side that you talked about and its role? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we engage with people living with diabetes in various ways. We, we have um, questionnaires. We hold focus group discussions. We gather data from our helpline. Um, we have online forums, we have peer support. So all of that information um, we're, we're gathering on a, on a regular basis and using that information, as I said, to, to influence um, healthcare systems. So that's, you know, at political um, levels, Scotland wide, at local level, at health board level. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, and, and the, the data sharing piece then, the fears that patients still have, how do we allay some of those, do you think? I think it's a really important point and many people are aware of it, of course, from, from just general living all day. The apps that we use ourselves, our wearables, all the information that, that's being shared with companies and potentially um, with, with other organisations or globally. I think Certainly, um, within Scotland and the diabetes community, we have the database that we use is very encrypted, it's very secure. And when I talk about data sharing, it, really what I'm uh, um, alluding to there is actually the person's personalised data. So that is actually taking the, the variables or the data points we got for them. It could be blood measurements, you know, laboratory measurements, blood pressures or risk measurements, or as I say, photographs, eye photographs or food. 
that's their data and it's sharing them for the purposes of education, information and helping with self-management. The other data that, that goes into the, the database, well, we have, we have huge systems now growing around GDPR within healthcare. So for instance, I can give you an example. I, um, with the SBRI project, we're looking at data, but it's always aggregated, it's always anonymized. And we have to go through code cut guardianships at health board level. We have now secure um, DPI type forms that have to be filled in. And that, that also involves any firms or companies we might be working with. So if we were to work with an SME or do some research, they all have to go through the same process if there's any access to patient data. So they're never ever given personal data that's never shared. There are all these checks and balances in place to make sure that, that actually can't happen. So our companies in the SBRI are actually looking at the data it's in a safe haven. So it's already wiped of anything that's identifiable at all. And yeah. it's signed off by the health board and then by the, the safe haven before they can even get access to it. And so that's what they will get access to. There's, there's no question of anybody that you're working with, certainly in that kind of environment, having access to personalised data just wouldn't happen, basically. Okay, lovely, thank you. I guess for those of us who live in the inside the NHS, you know, we, we live with Caldicott and DPIA all the time, but it doesn't always translate necessarily into the right message to the to the citizen who doesn't live with us. So I've got one last question, which is that both of you mentioned the statistics about the percentage of people with type 2 diabetes in, in, in Scotland and the Highlands. And the question says, may not be statistically significant, but it looked like the Highlands had a higher prevalence than other parts of Scotland. Is that is is it is there any reason for that, or is it just not a st statistically significant difference? So the the prevalence I gave you were called crude prevalence, and that's related to the age of our population. So we have an older population. So if you actually adjust that prevalence for age, it comes down to the Scottish right. or for okay. type two diabetes. We we do have a slightly higher instance of type one diabetes, and there's all sorts of theories for that in terms of our Scandinavian genes, etc. But the type two yeah. is is similar to the Scottish average overall. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so it only remains for me to say thank you to you both and to Partha, who is no longer with us. Uh, and just to note for all of those um, still still with us, that uh, those companies that we focused on um, uh, were part of a broader B2HC programme. Next year, if the programme continues, with diabetes is going to be a big focus area for that programme. So we will be looking for more companies with exciting ideas in in diabetes as a, as a big focus area for us next year. So if you're an SME listening to this and you've got something exciting and fresh, please get in touch. Uh, with that, I'll hand back, I think, to Katrina. Yeah, I'd just like to echo what Adrian was saying and thanking um, Sandra McCrudy, Alison Grant and Partha Carr um, for all their really useful insights um, today and also to Adrian for hosting. And um, and I thought those videos were excellent from Warner Patch, Map My Diabetes and Healthy IO. So massive well done to you guys for putting that together. And it's really great to see what you're doing. And um, yeah, I'd just like to flag up to, to everybody today about the Pathfinder Accelerator program that we've got open for applications now. The deadline is the 20th of April. So if you would, if you have a business um, in mind, an, an idea, um, just do please get in touch and you can arrange a one-to-one -one session with Jamie McCallum. The, the contact details are just on the screen there. So please do um, keep that in mind. And if you do want to, um, if you have somebody else, like another a friend or relative that would be interested, just pass on the information. And the other thing we have um, happening is another two sessions. We've got um, we've got the ophthalmic and orthopaedic care webinar happening soon, and also the health products for purchase by consumers. So keep a lookout for them. They're coming shortly, and um, we look forward to seeing you at those two webinars as well. So thank you for attending today and we'll see you soon.